Um, before I begin the sermon, I'd like to say a word to people who will watch this um, on the internet. Um, we have our sermons posted, and so if you're if you're viewing this sermon via the internet or our website, um, I want to welcome you, and then I want to invite you um, to come and personally join us in worship where we gather together as a body of believers. We would love to see you here. Also, to let you know that if you're watching via the internet because you've been sick or you're at home ill, that our prayers are with you. So um, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn to the New Testament book of Romans chapter 8. We're going to be looking this morning at verses 31 through 39. Um, these are Romans 8, just in and of itself, the whole chapter is an incredibly popular chapter in the Bible. Uh, a lot of people have this scripture memorized. A lot of people hold on to it very closely. Uh, people who uh, find themselves uh, facing death or the death of a loved one, um, people who are still in the shadows of that uh, find great comfort in this scripture. I would say to you today that no matter where we are, as I mentioned earlier, no matter where we are in life, there's beautiful comfort in knowing that nothing can change God's love for us. So if you have your Bibles with you, Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. If you do not have your Bibles with you, the words um, are found on the screen. I would invite you to stand as you are able to hear and to receive into your hearts the word of God. <clears throat> what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn it is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. But no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this promise. Uh, thank you for what it means to us in times of joy and for what it means to us in times of great pain. And so speak to us this morning in our own brokenness and remind us of your unbroken love. For we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. When I was serving at A&M, we had a little boy named Cade Locklear, and Cade loved to usher. He started ushering in the contemporary worship service when he was about two. And uh, so he, uh, he would, with his dad, he would stand with his dad. Well, one of his favorite things to do was to show you his muscles. And so, any time, and so of course, I could not get enough of that. You know what I'm saying? So every time I would see Cade, I'd be like, show me your muscles. And so he would do that thing, you know? And his chin, everything, his neck would bulge out and all that. And uh, so his parents told me that they, they were running into a little bit of a problem with Cade kind of at home because when he would get mad or upset or sad or pretty much kind of anything, he would, you know, show his muscles. So a few weeks ago, I was, I was in College Station visiting my son and some friends and, and for my mom's birthday and stuff. And uh, I ran into his mom, Alyssa, and she's like, oh, please come by the house. You haven't even had a chance to see... Our little girl, Annie, she was born right after we left, and I've never even met the little girl. So I went by their house and got to meet Annie, and they said, watch what Annie can do. And so they said, Annie, show Pastor Lorinda your muscles. And she went, oh, it was so cute. It's not cute at all when I do it, and I know that I'm not, but in my mind, I know it's impossible for you to do this, but in my mind, I'm picturing those cute little kids. You just get this. But um, she, she was showing her muscles, and so I was thinking about that a little bit this week and how, uh, how often we, we want to feel strong. You know, we, 
we want to be strong. And sometimes people even tell us, you need to be strong. It's your job to be strong. Sometimes I think what they're even trying to communicate to us a little bit is like, just flex your spiritual and emotional muscles right now and pretend that everything is okay. And that becomes problematic for us when we can't allow ourselves um, to, be, to be broken. We can't allow ourselves to show woundedness to one another or to God. And we try to hide that from each other and from God. And the problem is, it doesn't go away. We need to be able to be vulnerable and to show that and to express that. Um, the truth is we all live in a broken world and, and it's really actually impossible for any of us to get through life without pain and without some brokenness and some woundedness. We're going to experience losses in our lives that really bring us to our knees. So how do we deal with that? Is it that we try to tell ourselves, I'm unbreakable. I'm completely unbreakable. I'm so strong, you know, that nothing can break me. There's this show on Netflix that my kids got me to start watching called Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. And it's written and produced by Tina Fey. So if you know anything about Tina Fey, you can imagine just how quirky this show is. Um, but it's also funny and really quirky. It's not for everybody, but I like it. And uh, my daughter likes it, so we watch it together. And the whole premise of this show is that Kimmy's been through a horrible ordeal, and they don't go into that really much. They just show her life after the ordeal. And the whole premise behind the show is that Kimmy Schmidt is unbreakable that she's got this unbreakable spirit, and even though she's been through this horrible ordeal, she's starting her life all over in New York City, and she's unbreakable. But you know, as the show goes on, you know, being a pastor, I'm always looking for these kinds of things, even in a Tina Fey comedy, um, where they, they show that she did not get through this ordeal unbroken. But there's a lot about her that's extremely wounded, and um, they do not fail to point out that Kimmy may be unbreakable in her determination, but she is not unbroken. And neither are most of us. Neither are most of us. And when you look at the statistics of brokenness in our world today, it's, it's just staggering. It really is, it's quite staggering. The number of people who are walking around still carrying the pain of abuse that left them with the title victim. The number of people who are dealing with addictions of all sorts, one or another, be it chemical, sexual, physical, emotional, the number of people who are still walking in the valley of the shadow of death and the number of people who are trying to hide that brokenness, it's literally staggering. Yet most of us want to be survivors, right? And most of us want to have joy. Most of us want to not just be survivors, but be people who thrive in life, even in our brokenness. Um, we want to be people who, who experience and, and show love. We want to be people who experience and express joy. We want to be people who celebrate life and the life that's been given to us. So how is it that we can celebrate, even in the midst of the pain and the brokenness that we experience in life, how is it that we can celebrate that? Now, this passage that we just read this morning um, is one of the most profound reminders of what we as Christians continue to celebrate, even in the midst of woundedness and brokenness. It's what we continue to celebrate. And if there's ever been, in a, time, been a time in your life when you were reading some of Paul's writings in the New Testament where Paul, he, you know, he can be a little intense. And if you've ever been reading some of his writings and you've thought, maybe this guy really missed the mark, as some theologians have suggested, have, he's missed the mark on the grand theme of God's love. This, this scripture will put that idea to rest for you. Because Paul's whole argument in this chapter, and specifically in this paragraph, is about God's unchanging love for us through his son, Jesus Christ. It's a reminder, and it's all about that because of what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, you and I can live in the absolute assurance that nothing can shake that love. Because of what, because of what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, nothing can shake God's love for us and nothing can deter it or get in the way of it completing um, its, its destiny, it, completing its job, completing its job. There's no power, no principality that can ever turn it aside from doing what it's intended to do. The love of God will defeat and outlast all of the enemies um, that we see in life, that we experience in life. And we need that kind of assurance in our life 
that God's love is even victorious over death itself. I kind of like to know what the future holds, but not, not a whole lot. Like if somebody came up to me and they said, hey, listen, I have the ability to tell you everything that's going to happen to you for the rest of your life. I can tell you how long you're going to live. I can even tell you how you're going to die. I'm like, get away from me. You know, I do not want to know. I mean, I'd even be comfortable if my husband came home and said, hey, pack a bag, I'm taking you somewhere, and I'm not going to tell you where it is. I'd be like, okay, I'm going, I'm ready. Uh, but most of us, we, we kind of want to know what the future holds, especially when it's something really significant. When our daughter was so sick, I wanted to know, what does this mean for her future? What's going to happen to her? We, we want to know. We need assurances in life. And this scripture is one of the deepest assurances. Um, in our relationship with God, love is the ultimate assurance. It's stronger than logic. Sometimes the, God's love for us does not even make sense. It doesn't make sense. We can't help but wonder, God, why would you love me? Or maybe we're pretty, pretty self-confident. We're like, I get why you love me. I'm pretty good, pretty good person. But why do you love that person? I mean, it doesn't always make sense. And love is not a strange idea for us to somehow work out or explain, but it is, an, it is a fact, and it's an experienced fact, something that just cannot be denied any more than you can deny your need for air. And yet, it can be so confusing to us sometimes that we, we just want to be really sure, God, even though, even though this you still love me. Most of you know Will Rice. He was one of our pastors here. He served here for several years. And, and many of you know that he and his wife, Alicia, adopted two little boys named Samuel and Joshua. They're adorable. How cute are they? I love to be with them. Um, so not to, you can take it down now. Not too long ago, you can take it down now. Uh, not too long ago, um, I guess it was last fall, Will was telling me that Joshua was going through, the older, his older son was going through kind of this phase where it became really hard for him in his young mind to believe that his parents would always love him. Now, that's an issue for most of us, but for Joshua, this was huge. He had a very difficult beginning. So one day he went to Will, his daddy, and he, and he asked him, Daddy, will, will you always love me? And Will said, yes, Josh, I will always love you. And Joshua said, well, even if I do something bad, will you still love me? And Will said, yes, Josh, I'll still love you. He said, what if I get a, a folder mark at school? Will you still love me then? And Will said, yes, Josh, I'll still love you. And he said, what if I hurt someone at school? And Will said, well, I'll be disappointed, but I'll still love you. And he said, Daddy, what if I become a bad person? Will you still love me? What if I become a robber? And Will said, Josh, I will always love you. And Joshua said, but Daddy, what if I blow up the whole world? Will you still love me then? And Will said, well, Josh... I won't be here anymore and neither will you. But I will still always love you. I will always love you. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to us that no matter what, God always loves us. Paul, he goes down the list of things just in case we've decided that there, one that there might be one that doesn't fit. Paul, in his writings here in Romans, makes the statement that nothing can separate us from the love of God, and then he kind of amps it up by listing all the candidates to be considered, kind of like Joshua Rice did. Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or peril or nakedness or sword, how about those things? How about any one of those things? And Paul's using scripture out of Psalms, that, will, that the people will resonate well with when he speaks these words. And he's not writing it from an armchair a, 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 in a living room in an uncomfortable spot. He's writing this facing his own persecution and possible death. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. He lists all the possible candidates and says, no, none of these things, no, not one of these things can shake the love that God has for us. 
There's a formidable list, a formidable list of potential candidates and potential enemies who seem bent on separating believers from God's love. And Paul lists them. And then what he does is he places that conflict on the map of God's purposes for us and declares all those things defeated. Defeated. They don't have the last word. Not hardship or distress or persecution. Not even death has the final word or the final victory. Paul says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. And he says, for I am convinced, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor or rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate you and me, all of us, from the love of God that he has for us through his son, Christ Jesus. And so the question kind of pops up for me in some of this, in this um, scripture, is that how in our brokenness and how in our broken world, um, with filled with people carrying around lots of woundedness and brokenness and pain, in the midst of all that brokenness, is there um, anything that remains unbroken? Is there anything that remains unbroken? And the scripture reminds us that through all of it, God's love for us remains unbroken. It remains unbroken. As Will said to, to Joshua, there may be times when he's disappointed, but he will never stop loving his son. God will never stop loving us. And that something, is there something for us to celebrate? It's found in this scripture. The answer is a resounding yes. We can celebrate we can. That's why so often, if not every time, we have a funeral in this church. The bulletin refers to it as a celebration of the life and resurrection of that person. A celebration of the life and the resurrection. It is painful to experience loss in this life. It creates brokenness in our hearts that we must turn to God with that brokenness and allow God to heal us and restore us in our woundedness and in our brokenness. God's great love for us remains unbroken. That is our reality. Um, I just read a book on Kindle. Um, the book is titled Unbroken. Um, and in, as a matter of fact, across the street um, in the main in the main office where we have this book for sale. And I'm going to tell you, though, this book is not for everyone. Um, in fact, there were places in, in, my, in my Kindle when I read it where I, I skipped through because of um, some of the brutality that is described in this book. But it's a story of the life of Louis Zamperini. Um, he was an Olympic, um, Olympic medalist. And it tells his whole life from the time that he was born and the childhood that he lived through. Um, just unbelievable, and yet the way that they talk about his childhood and his youth is that he, he survived it unbroken. And then World War II begins, and um, he joins the Air Corps, and um, his plane goes down in the Pacific Ocean. His B-24 goes down in the Pacific Ocean, and, and he and some of the other people on the plane with him um, face thousands of miles of open ocean over 47 days and when they see a, a, a boat coming to rescue them, uh, first a plane comes over and shoots at them, and some of the people on the raft are killed. But Louis and two others survive. But when the boat comes to, rec to rescue them, um, it's a Japanese boat, and they are put in a prison camp. And the man who ran that prison camp was called the Bird, and his reputation was one of the most brutal men involved in that but he gets out and he's and he says I'm free I'm free I'm free and the, the book says that he survived the war unbroken but the reality is that Louis was not unbroken he was anything but unbroken he got married to the woman of his dreams but he couldn't stop having these horrible nightmares about the bird to the point where he would dream in every one of them in these nightmares that he was retaliating and taking the life of his captor and his persecutor, his tormentor. 
one night he woke up in the middle of the night from one of these nightmares and he was actually had his hands around his wife's neck and was choking his pregnant wife and he knew that he was broken but he didn't know what to do about it so he just started drinking and he drank and he drank he just became so wrapped up in his alcoholism that he was losing everything his family his wife everything he was losing it he was losing it all he the book is called unbroken he was such a broken man but his wife Cynthia talked him into going to a Billy Graham revival one night and Louis went mad as he could be about having to go to this and because of Billy Graham's words about grace and forgiveness Louis Zamperini became so angry he left the revival in a rage and left his wife and ran away from it all but for some reason he came back the next night and he told his wife I'll go and I'll stay right till the point where he says with every eye closed and every head bowed and then I'm out but he didn't leave he stayed and in that moment he he released all that brokenness and all that woundedness and all that pain and he turned it over turned it over to God he went home that night and got out his his cabinet of alcohol and poured it all down the drain never drank again began a ministry to young boys who were troubled kind of like he had been in his youth last July he died at the age of 97 and over his the rest of his life he impacted millions of people for the gospel of Jesus Christ what was it about Louis's life that was unbroken when you look at the title of the book and when you hear the words that he survived his childhood and he survived the war, he survived all these things unbroken. What was unbroken in Louis's life was the love that God had for him. Louis began to realize all those times when he really should have died and he didn't, that God had some purpose for his life. God had a purpose for his life. And so I want to say to you this morning that Whatever your, whatever, I, I don't know what your, most of you, I don't know what brokenness is in your life. I, I know what's in mine. I, I know a few of you and what's in yours. But, but I believe that most of us have some, some brokenness and some pain in our lives that maybe we've, we've pushed down and we've, you know. And I want to remind you this morning that this scripture speaks truth and reality into your life. That there is nothing that can ever separate you from God's love and God's love from you. That is what is unbroken in this world. Let's pray together about that.